So we, our speakers for today are Nimo Bassi and Sunita Narayan, both of whom are both globally known um, for their work on in the environment in many capacities, but especially for the environmental activism, which has been um, very, very effective in changing a number of things uh, on a number of counts. And you will hear about that very soon. Uh, Nimo Bassi is a Nigerian architect. He's an environmental activist, and he's also a poet. He co-founded Environmental Action, Rights Action, which is a Nigerian NGO, and he's also, he also founded a chapter of Friends of the Earth International. Currently, he's chairman of both ERA and FOEI. He's, as, as well, he's chairman of both, and, and not only that, he started his advocacy work um, about a couple of decades ago, Nemo, in the 1990s, denouncing multinationals and governments for environmental and economic mismanagement, as well as human rights abuse in the Niger Delta oil exploration area. He's got a very strong stance, he says, against carbon fuels and carbon credits markets, both in Nigeria and elsewhere. He criticizes false alternatives, such as agrofuels. He's author of the book, To Cook a Continent, Destructive Extraction and the Climate Crisis in Africa, which is published very, very recently, just this year. He was also awarded the Right Livelihood Award, which is, as you know, often called the Alternative Nobel Prize. Perhaps it should be the reverse, uh, <laughs> especially for environmental protection and human rights, since environmentalists have often got it right and economists have often got it wrong. <laughs> so I'll, I, I give to you Nimo Bassi. I will introduce Sunita Narayan um, in, after Nimo has finished his presentation. So, folks, let's give him a clap. Thank you very much for that very generous introduction. Uh, good afternoon, brothers and sisters. Good afternoon, brothers and sisters. Good afternoon. Thank you. <laughs> Well, everybody said uh, the workers. <laughs> yeah, we don't we don't fight the workers; we fight the corporations. Well, I'll be speaking on the green in the green economy, and as quickly as I can, uh, it's a real privilege to be here sharing the platform with my friend and very inspiring activist, who's. Uh, part of whose work in India helped me to stop drinking Coke. <laughs> yeah, because of the pesticides and all the water that they, they take, yes. So um, now we are in Rio, and of course we all know that this conversation is in the context of multiple crises in the world, and I believe, actually, that the policymakers who spend weeks and years in negotiations, they know the actual causes of this crisis, but they have decided to be blind to this fact and are more attracted to false solutions. The financial crisis, the economic crisis, food crisis, climate crisis, energy crisis, they, they they all can be traced to the same speculations and overconsumption and wrongful modes of production based on a civilization model that is completely outmoded, but which is still being pushed. Civilization based on fossil fuels, which is driving the world to a dead end. The four solutions to global climate change in includes the reliance on agrofuels, which has led to very severe land grabs in the tropical regions of this world, generating conflicts and driving many into poverty. And then, of course, through geoengineering, the sky is being grabbed. And of, the sky has been grabbed already even before geoengineering because the carbon space has been taken up by, by those who are now refusing to accept responsibility. And the sea grabs. So everything is being grabbed. Now, what is really shocking about Rio, but not so surprising, is that 
the basic principles that were agreed in 1992, uh, the attempts are being made to renegotiate this or to ignore them or to, to just blow everything and say, no, we cannot specifically mention anything. Let's just say, okay, we affirm the real principles. Uh, this kind of attempt to, to blind uh, the world to the need for real commitment, reaffirmation and recommitment and the checking of the scorecards of countries to see where we've been since 1992 should not be acceptable. Just early, it was only this early this morning that the negotiators agreed to include a direct reference to common board differentiated responsibilities. I mean, why should it take so long before a, a, an issue of justice and fairness should be, should be agreed? The precautionary principle has become like uh, something that polluters want to avoid because they, they want to embark on risky technologies without any caution whatsoever. Then just looking at the, the, the UNEP definition of green economy, you've read the booklets produced by UNEP to advance the, the whole concept. <laughs> there comes the moderator. <laughs> Please welcome <laughs> Professor Martinez. <laughs> I, I will introduce him after the, my presentation. <laughs> this is your seat. <laughs> Welcome. Okay. Thank you. I'm sure it was, I apologize on his behalf, he was trapped in the traffic. <laughs> no. Circumstances beyond his control. Now, the UNEP's report says that the concept of green, green economy does not replace sustainable development, but what really attracts my attention is that they say that sustainability rests almost entirely on getting the economy right. This elevation of the economy to ab above, above social justice, above environmental protection, above the need for a clear political space for engagement of communities and people who are impacted is something that I believe has laid a fundamentally wrong premise for green economy. Because green economy cannot be dependent on just uh, getting the economy right. And, but that thinking is in line with what has driven the world in the wrong direction when it comes to dealing with climate change, trying to get solutions. This is why false solutions are being promoted, why voluntary targets are being set, and nobody wants to make a real commitment. And of course, we know from what came out of Cancun, Copenhagen, Cancun, and Durban, that vulnerable nations and continents like Africa are being cooked, and the next decades will spell very severe situations where temperatures cannot be kept to anything close to two degrees, but probably three, four, five, six degrees centigrade. Africa will simply be fried. And some people think that, well, if that happens, Maybe Europe will get a bit warmer. I, mean, I know people can start growing tropical fruits and crops. And now, this, further, further to this kind of thinking about elevating the economy above everything else, this is the kind of thinking that is made policymakers believe that every part of nature can be commodified. In other words, that if nothing, if you, don't, if you cannot put value, monetary value to anything, then that thing is useless. If a UNEP says that if you cannot put a monetary value on something, then that thing cannot be valued. Monetary value cannot become the only value. What, what happened to the ethical value, the moral value, social value, the human value? Are we going to put monetary values on our lives? on the air that we breathe. I know values have been put on salt and they will lead to salt grabs, habitats for plants. People even talk about charismatic animals. Have you heard that? But I think when I read the UNEP report on, on green economy, the one that, what, I really, what really takes the cake is the box on pollination that says that the value of pollinators in a year is $190 billion. That really tickles my fancy. 
And so if we were to have a conference with butterflies and bees, they would say, okay, what we do in one year is what $190 billion pay us. And the question somebody asks, which I think is very valid, is do butterflies issue an invoice when they pollinate a plant? I think it's a question for economists. I know there are many economists in this room, and you can value anything, but to, value the, to give me the value of pollinators in a year, I think you are going over the board. Now, what is the color? What's, what is green? Is it just a color? I know green, we talk about green economy is more than a color. So uh, we cannot accept for brown business to call themselves green. The chemical industry, the oil industry, calling themselves green, I think they're making a bad joke. It's all because elevation of economy above everything else has made it op open up the space for market environmentalism and just keeping or putting a label of green over very destructive actions in the world. And I think we should be worried and we should really, really raise the alarm. This slide always runs very fast. Just want people to say, I, want, I think it should stay so that we can see that we believe, many of us believe that policy directions are going wrong, both in climate and in social development discourse because corporations have captured public spaces, they've captured political structures, and governments are being consulted by corporations instead of governments consulting corporations. Instead of governments talking with people and hearing what people really want. So corporations are clearly very taking the driving seat and using governments as shoe shine boys and blocking effective solutions to global problems. Uh, so energy, the, the other issue I want to speak about briefly is about the elevation of energy security to national security by some countries. That they must, if they need coal, they must get coal. If they need oil, they must get oil. If they need gas, they must get gas, no matter what the cost. And because of this and the massive energy need of the war machines, the carbon footprint of war machinery is not computed when it comes to calculation about global warming. And we do know that directly, they directly release a lot of uh, greenhouse gases apart from causing other devastation. So this energy security drive has multiplied military bases around the world and put Africa at great risk. In some cases, the military don't wear military uniform anymore. They wear t-shirts and khaki shorts like you know, civilian workers, building schools and clinics. But just when you're not looking, they have very powerful weapons in their pants. And so today, the green economy drive direction and the acceptance that um, just any kind of alternative is OK is driving extractivism in directions that will compound the problem. More mining for platinum for fuel cells, more mining of uranium for nuclear power, more copper, more crude oil. And as peak oil kicked in, the world is looking for crude oil in very fragile ecosystems. Very fragile ecosystems. In Brazil, crude oil is being Plants have been made to extract crude oil under three kilometers ocean water and a further three, three kilometers of rock to grab the oil. Now, when you recollect that in the Gulf of Mexico, the Gulf of Mexico was just, just about one point, the point where the accident happened in April 2010 is just 1.2 kilometers deep. And when that oil spill occurred, when that problem occurred, it took a long time for the problem to be solved. Now, when you are looking for oil beneath three kilometers of water, further three kilometers of rock, if any problem happens there, it's going to be a nightmare. The technology for all this maybe is being developed, but I think we're stretching it too far, scraping the bottom of the pot, looking for oil in fragile ecosystems, in inaccessible places, maybe even under the North Pole and South Pole. We should. We, the world ought to realize that the fossil fuel civilization has gone as far as it can go. 
It's time to retrace. We don't have to finish the oil before we look elsewhere. A foreign minister in Saudi Arabia once said that the stone age did not end for lack of stones. And the crude oil age would not end for lack of crude oil. It just needs thinking and redirection. But the pursuit of endless consumption, endless growth, endless production for the accumulation of capital is blinding us to this reality. And people say crude oil is cheap energy source. It is not, as economists will agree. We just need to count the cost of the environmental devastation, the cost of lives being destroyed. In my country, the United Nations Environmental Program, UNEP, who is hosting this conference more or less about green economy, has accessed the economy of the environment of Ogoni land. And the assessment is that it's going to require 30 years to clean the waters in Ogoni land. And all extraction stopped there in 1993 when Shell was expelled by the local people. All extraction stopped in 1993. Now we require 30 years to clean the water and five years to clean the land. And the land must be cleaned first before the water. So 35 years cumulative work to clean the land. And some of the soils are polluted to a depth of five meters with hydrocarbons. Some of the waters in Ogoni land have benzene levels 900 times above World Health Organization standards. Now, when you have this kind of devastation from an energy source, I don't think we need to argue that this is too deadly for anybody to play with. And crude oil is not cheap. The fuel we buy at the petrol gas station is being subsidized by human blood, by lives, and by livelihoods that are being destroyed. So we're scraping the bottom of the barrel. The cost of, I already talked about this, remember, look at the tar sands extraction in Canada. It's absolutely horrible that a thing like that can be happening in North America. But of course, it's happening in the territory occupied by First Nation people. So you have the global south in the global north, and what, wherever you found, find the south, whether the north or the south, it's a place to be trashed, exploited, for the benefit, not of the people there, but elsewhere. And that photo on the screen is uh, from a, a gas rig fire that occurred in Nigeria on 16th January this year. A Chevron gas rig exploded, killing two workers they couldn't account for. And then it took a whole month. Before, that water was just burned on the ocean surface. It took one month before they started drilling the relief well. And then the fire suddenly stopped. And they said, we don't know why the fire stopped. Talk about high-tech corporations. They can't explain why the fire stopped. They said maybe some rocks fell into the well. But the gas is still leaking, just that the fire stopped. Fishermen cannot, the fish in this territory is completely polluted. Whales are washing up the shore dead from the pollution. And when one whale dies, the indication is that thousands of other species, the smaller ones, have been destroyed. Talk about fracking. I don't know what the frack that is. The sad thing about Africa is that oil is found. You can, oil, you can count countries where there's no oil right now in Africa. Oil is being found everywhere, especially along the coast, all around. In the Rift Valley, a long, fragile ecosystem, all is being found in, in nature reserves. In fact, one particular nature reserve I visited in Uganda, uh, the oil company has built an airstrip when they're coming with their light aircraft, the workers on the, the air control, people on the ground, have to chase the animals away so that the planes can land. Now, when you go to a place like that to extract oil, I think we're becoming very immoral. Those are pictures from from, from, um, from Uganda, you can, see, you can see, this is a nature reserve. See the oil rig? See oil rig, oil rigs. This is completely unacceptable against every international code about areas preserved that should not be, um, should not be exploited in this way. In Uganda, in Tanzania, in Kenya, the oil is being found in places that are World Heritage Sites. But because the world is so addicted to crude oil, and we have this concept that crude oil is cheap, then anything is acceptable. Clearly, this is not acceptable. This is a photo of a mature oil and gas field from the United States. 
I don't think anybody wants to have this kind of field in his backyard, but I, I, I would like them to have more in the United States. Apologies, I didn't mean that. <laughs> but I think that would help us to reach decisions quicker about this kind of destruction. I already mentioned this oil fields all over the continent, and because the country, governments in Africa are looking for direct foreign investment to pay off debts they, they ought not to have owed in the first place, this is being extracted. The gross domestic product, the GDPs are going up, and poverty is spreading on the ground. So we have this kind of fictional economic measurements that don't reflect the reality on the ground. Corruption is not only about finance. I think we have a serious problem of resource corruption, which is driving conflict. When people consume tomorrow, today, it means we are not thinking about our children and grandchildren. And when we believe, when we think that it's only by you know, using certain instruments that we can integrate economies, then of course these are ways of opening up for land grabs, for all kinds of grabs, soil grabs, biomass grabs, and whatever. I'm just, I just decided to bring this in because the community people are not just sitting down and taking the beating. There are a lot of struggles on the ground, resistance on the ground, and most of the cases are peaceful, using legal avenues to, to challenge the monsters who are creating problems uh, around uh, our continents and around our countries, around our environment. Now, I want to conclude by talking about the clean development mechanism, which in my experience is nothing but, it's not anything clean. Now, we have a lot of gas flares. Gas flares in Nigeria, like the ones you are seeing, these are gas that are associated with crude oil extraction. When, they, when crude oil is extracted and piped to flow stations, the crude oil is separated from the gas. Now the gas can actually be, co can be collected and transformed to liquefied natural gas we use for domestic purposes, for power generation or for whatever, or you can just light a match and burn it. Up to 80% of the gas extracted in Nigeria goes up in flames. And yesterday I got to learn that even some of the liquefied natural gas imported by Brazil from Nigeria is equally flat right here in Brazil. So that's like exporting gas flares. I was really shocked to hear that. Now, where does the CDM come from when about from gas flares? The corporations are saying, well, we're utilizing the gas to generate power, so we're stopping this amount of carbon from going to the atmosphere. But we need to understand that in 1990, from 1998, gas flaring was outlawed in Nigeria. So it's an illegal activity, completely illegal, unconstitutional. A court declared it unconstitutional in November 2005. And so if you carry out an activity, you're stopping an activity that is already illegal. It does not make any sense to think that that, act, that action should be compensated with carbon credits. <coughs> You're stopping an illegal activity. There's no additionality. It's something you ought to have done. But the system approves this, and these are listed as CDM projects. What it tells me is that the whole CDM scheme is a scam, fraud, to benefit powerful entities who can twist the truth and have their way. CDM for stopping illegal is like compensating an armed robber for stopping robbery. And so the world will say, see no evil, hear no evil, speak no evil, but we have to speak the evil because we can't be quiet when our back is being plowed. I personally believe that resistance is a, a major form of advocacy. And communities and people around the world have to determine the means by which they will resist. And they have to speak as loud as they can. Sometimes those of us in advocacy, we, we delude ourselves by saying that we're speaking for communities or we're helping to amplify the voice of community people. The voices of community people are already loud enough. The problem is that policymakers are just not listening. So our work should be to unplug the ears of policymakers. 
that they will hear the cries of the people on the ground. It's enough for all the externalization of costs to poor people. The green economy cannot go on that pattern. Otherwise, the green we're hearing about is nothing but just a color. Green in my community is a, is a sign of resistance. You can see the women in that photo. They're holding leaves, protesting against Shell, asking it to pack out of the community because green is the color of life. So whatever goes against life, when you raise a green color to it, it means it's time to change direction. But we'll come here to talk about a green economy that is pushing on with the same paradigm, the same brown economy, the same deadly paradigm, then that, to me, is not green. Because operation and development can never coexist. I've tried to articulate some of these points in my book, Tokuke Continent, and I believe that we could talk about this for hours. But of course, I believe at the end we're going to have a period of time for conversation on these issues and for clarification of other issues and deepening of the things that we're talking about. So let me conclude by saying that we'll keep on struggling until victory is won, because enough is enough. Thank you. Thank you very much, and I'm sorry it was late at the beginning. <clears throat> I, I knew about Nemo Basel in 1995 when All Watch was founded. This was when Ken Sarawiba and other people, eight other people, nine were killed in, by the military dictatorship in Nigeria after fighting against Shell, Ogonis. And he went to Ecuador, I know, and, and wrote a book even about this when he met people from Acción Ecológica and they founded All Watch. And in 97 already, All Watch went to Kyoto to the alternative meetings, to the unofficial meetings, and proposed this idea of an old moratorium in fragile areas. So since then, something that Nemo invented as uh, leave oil in the soil, leave coal in the hole, and leave what? There sands in the land and leave gas under the grass, if you, if you will allow me this very bad, uh, I mean, I'm not really an English poet at all. But uh, this idea is very reasonable, because if we take all the oil, the gas, at the present speed, we are putting too much carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Therefore, where should it be left on the ground, where there are people living on top of it, where uh, the biodiversity is largest, and therefore from here to the Yasuni ITT idea, which is more than an idea in Ecuador, there was not a short step, but a 10-year step, and is still under question whether this is going to be realized, the Yasuni ITT idea. Nima Basik has been involved in many, many issues and fights, but I know this one quite well from the inside, and, and this is so I'm sorry I was late, but I can now reintroduce you again uh, if this was not mentioned before. And now Sunita Narayan is another so well-known activist in the environmental field for already more or less the same time, in the 80s. And I remember the first time I went to India in 88, I just bought on the street the, the report, the citizens' report on the environment of India. And this was what we call now collaborative science research because it was they asked people who knew about it, whether academics or activists, because activists know quite often more than academics because of experience, and they put up this series of reports when Anil Agarwal was leading the science for the Center for Science and Environment. So the famous CSE that they put up reports continuously down to earth and so every, anybody who knows anything about the environment or anything about India or both things together knows about Sunita Narayan and the many prizes she has had, the water prize and so on in Stockholm and other things I don't know about. So here we have two people who might get even bigger prizes in future, but they are not working for the prizes but for the fellow humans and for the environment. So Sunita is going to speak now and then we'll have uh, some minutes for uh, questions to both of them. It's a real privilege for me as well to be on the same 
panel as Nemo and, uh, and you. Um, I have, um, I mean, I see you both as my gurus and people whose thinking work has shaped a lot of what we do. So thank you very much. Um, and thank you, Bina, for inviting me. Thank you also, Peter, for both inviting and hosting me here. Um, I'm delighted to be here. I'm delighted to be here to speak to, to this very important community of, uh, of economists, of ecological uh, economists, who can help us to understand the shape of matter as it's going to emerge in the world. Let me, you know, Nemo has touched a lot on what I think we have very common um, perspectives. And let me just sort of elaborate on, on some of the things that I can see. I was here last in 1992 at the Rio summit. At 1992 at the Rio summit, uh, we had a very similar moment to what we have today. Um, and yet with very big differences. Uh, this was also a time when there was recession in uh, the rich countries, particularly the United States. Um, I remember very vividly the, the, the scenes that took place on the beaches of, uh, of Rio with the energy of people shouting down Bush Sr. at that time who had just gone to a shopping market just before coming to Rio and had told the American people that they needed to consume more because unless they, they consumed, they would not eat their way out of the economic crisis. That was 1992. It was also a moment when uh, there was huge citizens' action, people's action, challenging that worldview and saying that and putting environment, and particularly global environmental issues, for the first time on, on the map, on the global map. So climate change arrived as an issue that the world cared about. And as much as climate change arrived on the scene, the concept of living within the means or the limits of the Earth also became real. But also, in 1992, because climate change was fundamentally a crisis of, um, of the way markets functioned, and also climate change was fundamentally an issue which forced the world to think about how it would reallocate resources, how it would redistribute resources, because if we needed growth, we could not afford that growth model for all. Those were issues on the table in 1992. And to some extent, there was movement ahead. To some extent, we all went back thinking that Rio was a disappointment because it didn't push far enough. But those issues were on the table. We understood the challenge of reinventing growth without pollution. Yet, if you think about the last 20 years, and you sort of recap what has happened. What are the big takeaways from the last 20 years? The big takeaways have been that you've actually seen a period of unparalleled growth in the world. You have seen a period of unparalleled globalization in the world, where economies have got interlinked as never before, where interests have become common of the developed and the developing uh, world. So in some senses, we are all enjoined today in the fact that we have to have a consumption-based economy, and that has to be as cheap as possible so that um, 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 we can enjoy the fruits of economic growth. It's also a period which has seen unparalleled liberalization, where markets have come to be the basis, the drivers of uh, this so-called economic growth. So in, 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 when you think back on that 20 years period, you had Rio, you had the principles articulated, you had the challenge enunciated, 
you even understood that there was a need to do something differently you set up um uh, negotiating uh forums you decided that some action had to be taken and yet in the last 20 years you have somewhere or the other not been able to follow that line not been able to walk the talk because the reverse has actually happened that that is something of what happened other than the fact that today the world is also realizing that there are huge cracks in this uh growth model some would call it cracks some would call it fissures depending on which side your table you're sitting on but what is absolutely clear today is that the financial crisis doesn't seem to be going away that all the band-aid solutions that are being put don't seem to be able to fix what is so clearly broken and what is also more and more clear and gets clearer every time the one bank collapses or one country collapses is that this growth is costing us uh um our our growth itself and this growth is also costing us the planet what is also clear as was in 1992 but even clearer today as the middle class of the world has grown is that this growth model cannot be afforded for the entire world that the consumption and the lifestyle pattern of as we said in 1992 and we would repeat again uh today of either one american or even one rich indian cannot be emulated uh for the 7 billion inhabitants of this planet we just do not have those uh those uh resources now i i give you this piece of sort of a quick recap of history and current affairs only to say this was the opportunity that we had in rio rio 2012 could have learned from the mistakes of the last 20 years rio 2012 was an opportunity for us all to be here to say enough is enough exactly as nemo said that we need to reinvent that we've tried everything and that it hasn't worked we've tried all the gimmicks that the conventional economists and many of you i hope are not those sitting in this room have given us again and again we've every yarn that has been spun has been tattered every tool that has been invented has been found that it cannot fix this economy that is so desperately broken and yet when we come to 2012 we have in front of us a new buzzword green economy and if you think about it it's like in some senses we were we were very naive in 1992 and i'm just much older now so you have to forgive me when i say all this but in 1992 when the word sustainable development was coined we all went around saying what do we mean by sustainable development we don't quite know and yet today when i when i try and understand what do we mean by green economy we're exactly in the same situation nobody really knows what this creature called the green economy is okay and yet we're chasing it desperately we're negotiating on it we're fighting on it we have a whole bunch of people wearing suits and ties sitting in rio centro fighting about commas and full stops on how they will define this green economy and yet if you ask them what do you mean by a green economy i think all of them will have different answers now if you start looking at how green economy has been defined by the two proponents of the idea uh unep um and oecd and i'm simplifying perhaps they're very very uh, they must have a lot more depth to their uh, to their um, to their ideas but let me sort of let me simplify them as i understand them 
essentially a view that if you make the right investments um, um, into what we would consider green, um, uh, and particularly green technologies, you will start reinventing this world to become more sustainable. And if you put a price and a value on natural resources, it'll help decision makers make those right investment choices that will, that will drive this green economy. Now, that's broadly how, how the, 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 the debate has been, has been organized till now. Nothing wrong with it. I mean, you need investment. You need investment to go into things that we would all consider better. You need prices to be put as indicators to help you to understand. Nothing wrong with it. But it's not enough. It's too simple. It just does not in any way help us to move the world towards that big transition that we all talk about, but we don't have the guts to follow through on. If you just think about it, all the talk about efficiency, and there has been a lot of talk about efficiency. This is not a new word. This has not been coined yesterday when the green economy term was brought up. And if you look at all the work that has happened on efficiency, and I know in my field, in one of my fields, I work in Delhi, uh, pushing for a mobility transition because we find we cannot clean up our air um, by, uh, by investing in improved vehicles or more efficient vehicles. And yet, if you see that, there has been so much effort on cleaning up each vehicle, making the car much more efficient. That has been one part of the technology choices that need to be made. And yet, all evidence points to the fact that as you make cars more emission uh, efficient, they also get heavier, people drive more, people get richer, and so at the end of the day, you're back to the same problem of pollution, which is threatening the planet today. One of the areas that is emerging, and one area on which there is a lot of talk across Rio today, is the area of renewable technologies, one of the sustainable goals, development goals on which a green economy would be centered is the investment in renewable technologies. But the fact is that solar energy, if it is not designed to meet the needs of all, can only be another energy source yet it does not become a source to provide energy to millions of people. So the, so the question of the green economy is, is the objective solar energy and renewables, or is the objective providing energy access to large numbers of people, particularly people who cannot afford the energy systems of today? Now, green economy is all about solar. And it assumes that solar energy is, uh, is, is the end to all our problems. I, I think these are just two simplistic views. And I think this is a Band-Aid, another green Band-Aid, which will just not in any way fix the kind of crisis that we are in today. So where do we go from here? What do we do? And I think that really is something that I hope, I would have hoped that Rio would have articulated more clearly. The fact of the matter today is, and this does make me very sad, it makes me also, um, it should also make us very self-reflective, is that in 1992, to a large extent, the environmental concern was driven from people's action. It was driven from the fact that people were challenging the notions of economic growth and, and the power systems that existed. Yet, we governmentalized the environmental movement. And I think today, if you think about it, we do not have 
the ability to be able to articulate our own idea of what is that green economy how green is the green economy that is being talked about today in fact we bought into that hook line and sinker and i think that's really the tragedy today of the global environmental movement it's not the tragedy of india's environmental movement and i will keep that very distinct it's much more alive in india but it's definitely a tragedy of the global environmental movement so what is our vision to my mind the green economy or sustainable growth or growth without pollution should just have three basic definitions and objectives one growth that is equitable very critical to make sure that that becomes the principle that drives economic growth in the future because only when growth is equitable can it be sustainable and i think that principle has to become the core of environmental thinking of environmental activism to growth that is socially just because without justice you cannot have sustainable growth and most importantly and or equally importantly growth that is affordable because at the end of the day the technology paradigm in which we are putting in so much faith is not affordable and if it is not affordable i can guarantee you it is not sustainable because it does not reach the people for whom it is meant so three principles how would you then articulate this further give you two examples and then then and and then um open it out for questions one when you look at climate change we have tried every kind of techno fix to climate change to the crisis of climate change and yet in 1992 when we were here in rio last the framework convention on climate change at least agreed to one thing which was fundamental that there was a huge natural debt of the rich countries that their accounts had been overdrawn as far as the use of natural capital was concerned and that the rich would therefore have to reduce to make space for the poor to grow there was an element of justice and equity which was established very tenuous not deep not not understood perhaps as deeply as it should and definitely not accepted by countries like the united states but still it was an agreement tenuous agreement that you would need a framework which was based on equity so the agreement was that the poor that the rich would reduce and the poor would grow but it was also agreed that the poor would grow differently because they had the pathway to be able to avoid making mistakes they could reinvent growth without pollution which is why there was an agreement on money and technology again tenuous but yet an agreement an understanding that growth as business as usual would not work that it was not in the south's interest as well in the developing countries interest to act to follow the same growth model to pollute and then clean up it was too expensive both for them and would cost us the earth that was that was an agreement and yet it has not happened we know that the rich did not vacate the space and the poor are playing today a desperate game of catch up the conflict today is on the distribution of the leftovers as i say the crumbs but we have not been able to change the way that we did follow through on the politics of climate change yet there is an opportunity here 
because if you were to create a framework which was based on rights and entitlements of every country to the global commons, equal rights and entitlements, you would create a framework of limits on all. You would create a framework which would demand, which was force redistribution of, of resources. You would force change at the scale that we have not seen today. So you would actually use the principles of equity to put limits on growth for all, and you would, which would in turn demand that growth as it is today could not be possible. So you could use the, the lever, the principle of what would be that green economy, the principle of equity, to rework the vision, the future direction of that growth itself. And I say this with, with some amount of anger at the fact, and, and you, again, you have to forgive me, as I said, I'm now old, I have the right to be angry, okay? <laughs> but, <laughs> but I also say this with enormous sense of faith and optimism because I see huge opportunities that are emerging from, say, my part of the world. Not all there, but still huge ways in which we could actually use these very important levers of democracy to make the change. In India today, we have what I call million pollution mutinies. All across the country, we have very large numbers of very poor people protesting against what we call development, simply saying that our kind of development will make them poorer than they are today. They accept the fact that they are poor, but they say that this development will only make them poorer. And the reason is very simple, because this, because they live on the environment, the environment is their livelihood, so any degradation of the environment means that it takes away life, it takes away livelihood. This is not a luxury, this is not something which is nice about intergenerational equity. This is about life and death as it exists today. It is about survival, today. And so there are protests. There are huge protests. And these protests have successfully blocked uh, Vedanta, which is not a small thing, which is a very large multinational, to, to many other projects being cancelled, whether they're dam projects or thermal power projects. Many protests lose, some protests win. There is no doubt. But there is there is huge activism, what, from, and yet if you look at it, this environmentalism of the poor is very different from the environmentalism of the rich, which is today talking about green economy. Because the environmentalism of the, of the poor is demanding a rethinking about the way we do business with nature itself. It is demanding that we reduce the amount of use of resources because there is a need of all that has to be met. So it's actually forcing us. We are not there yet as a country, but it will force us if these movements remain as grounded and as active. It will force us to think about growth differently. So if you think about these, these movements are built on principles of rights. These, these movements are built upon principles of democracy. So if we are indeed serious about green economy, then I think we shouldn't worry about the color it will be in the next 20 years. We should stop trying to paint it in any color that we think is more green. I think we should let green economies evolve, we should let the color of green evolve, but based on just one principle, the principle of deepening democracy, of increasing rights over the environment. 
So the issue is not price. The issue is rights. And the issue is not value over nature. The issue is the values of governance, values of society, values of humanity. So let's be very clear. In today's green economy, as it is being shaped in Rio Centro and by many economists whose writings I do uh, respect, to, is that these principles will not help us to move ahead. I will not be here 20 years from now, I think, but many of you will. And I assure you, you'll be sitting here saying, we've come a full cycle once again. It's not good enough. This is the time for us not to get lost in just another concept which is as empty, as shallow as the world would like us to, to be. Thank you very much. Open for questions. Before that, I want to say to them so that they understand. In this conference, we are to some extent divided on these issues. In the morning, was the pollination morning probably. Today, with tip, also coming from India to some extent, because of Pavan Sukhdev's role. Uh, but it doesn't matter the name. The question is like a current of opinion that to make things visible or nature visible, you have to put a price on it and it improves the visibility. I don't know. I yesterday said if somebody doesn't say doesn't see a sacred mountain as itself without a price, I mean I don't know what else we have to do. Uh, if somebody doesn't see the values of an ecosystem or an elephant, for instance, by itself, or a mangrove or whatever and without lenses of dollar valuation, of rupee valuation, then, well, they should change the, they should improve, they should go to the ophthalmologist, isn't it? <coughs> That's my view. But in this conference, there are these different views, and it's an academic conference, so we don't shout very much, and we discuss everything. But uh, what I see now is that reasons for optimism in the sense that there is this big movement for environmental justice. I think this has grown. It was Sunita Narayan with Anaila Garbal, who in 91, before Rio, they published this very influential booklet called Global Warming, a Case of Environmental Colonialism, deconstructing, the world was not very much yours, deconstructing the figures of the world, uh, what's the name, the WR, the I, and this was very influential, I think, in imposing this view of uh, a list in theory of historical responsibility from the rich countries in the case of, uh, for climate change. So we have a big movement of environmental justice, and we have here two of the main and conspicuous uh, representatives, uh, and the environmentalism of the poor has grown. There are more cases. There are also more, more people killed, environmentalists around the world, many in Latin America. It's not just Chico Mendes, many more after Chico Mendes, one every month perhaps. We should have statistics on this from UNEP. And we also have some in the tradition of radical thinking in ecological economics from Georgescu Reagan, Herman Daly. We have people like Tim Jackson are now so popular with prosperity without growth, or even some degrowth movements in the North, very small in terms of number of people participating. So there should be a confluence between this degrowth or steady state movements in the North and this very wide and potentially powerful movement on, of environmental justice. This has little to do with the green economy being discussed uh, I don't know where exactly in Rio, I haven't been there yet, and I don't know whether I'll go there, but uh, which is a bit of greenwashing to keep it shortly. Uh, so now we have the opportunity to ask questions if you want or to comment for the next, I think, 15 minutes, half an hour, 15 minutes. Thank you very much for two very inspiring talks. Can I ask both speakers to speak to your vision of the process to 
get to this just economy, as it were. And I'd like to ask you to address the role of government, and perhaps we've talked about capturing resources and capturing other things. What would it mean to capture government? In other words, to make it representative, to think through what does it mean to make this process of transition emancipatory? What visions do you bring to that of actual concrete process? A, a question to Sonita. In Brazil, we like to call people by first names. We are an informal country. Yeah, and that's, this is why I am calling you Sunita. The question about, uh, you have a fight against two giants of the brown economy, that's right? And uh, what does this fight teach us about uh, greening the economy or the possibility of having a green economy? What does it mean in relation to your uh, perspective about sustainable development. How, which lessons can we learn from your experience fighting to giants of the brown economy in relation to the green economy? Uh, thank you very much for the presentation. Um, I was hoping to ask the previous panel, uh, each individually, what the price of a queen bee is, but I never got the chance to do that, so I'm pleased to ask a question. Sunita, if I may address you, um, I found your position on economic growth a bit contradictory or a bit ambiguous. You deconstructed it. I got the impression you were into strong sustainability, and then suddenly you start using, which sounds very much like the language of the European Union, sort of like uh, fair growth or sustained growth or equitable growth. I'm just wondering why you still maintain the word growth in your articulation of equity, social justice, and so on, when in fact... When I first heard you speak, I thought there was a complete paradigm shift. Good afternoon. Um, I have a question for you, and that is in terms of um, sometimes uh, environmental justice almost becomes a euphemism. And I'm thinking in terms of when do we move from saying something in terms of environmental justice to environmental criminality or environmental genocide? And I just wonder if you have any comments on that aspect or that perception. Okay, um, thank you for the questions. I would um, answer some of them. The process to get a just economy, I think I would like to give that a shot. And from the perspective of environmental justice movement and resistance that we see around the world, uh, I believe that there are many processes. It's not one process. The, the cardinal single process that I would recommend is that of resistance, say no. When people say no to destructive patterns of development, of growth, then they've already started at a level of looking for alternatives. Uh, if people say, well, we can manage with it, then they were never going to get a real revolutionary alternative. And this is, the, this is the beauty of the People's Summit, for example. Contents of ideas, everybody coming, marching on the streets, saying we don't want this. We don't. People may say, well, they're just making noise, but I think it's a very fundamental step to say no to what you don't agree to. So to me, that's, that's the process to get the right solution. And for example, Juan was mentioning about leaving the oil in the soil. Now, leaving the oil in the soil sounds like a far-fetched proposal, but already, We've seen that to some extent working in Ecuador until and unless the president or the politicians change their mind about it. But so far, they've gone, around with, gone along with it for, for, for some years now. Then we've seen in Ogoni land in Nigeria where the people said no to the destructive destruction of oil from their territory, and they actually succeeded in stopping, stopping extraction. Now, thirdly, we see in South Sudan, a country that just, I mean, a country that emerged in July last year, very poor country, very few resources except crude oil, 98% of their revenue is from crude oil. And they said, no, we're stopping extraction until we can find a safe route for their pipeline. Now, even if they stop production for one week, to me, it's a, it's a clear indication that stopping oil extraction is possible and the world needs to take that step. So stopping it would force us to think about real alternatives. 
But just to say we can keep on going until, it's, until all is exhausted, then we're going to go with the same paradigm. And secondly, the solutions we need will come from people recovering our sovereignty. Our sovereignty has been lost even when we vote. We vote for politicians, and yet they do their thing. They become, they listen to only certain entities that they have interest in. Yesterday I was in a village outside, Rio, outside this metropolis, and a politician came to answer questions about environmental degradation in the Piranga area of, of, of this municipality. And one of the questions I asked him was, in all these development projects that you claim you're carrying out here, which of, how did, what was the process of consultation? And of course, politicians always think they know better than the people, they know what is right, and as long as they keep, they're allowed to think that way, we're not going to have the alternative. So we need to recover our sovereignty, break the power of, of destructive corporations from the government structures, and then we can begin to move. Then, the last question, environmental, uh, criminality. I think this is something that we really need to tackle in the world. We see politicians being taken to the International Court of Justice for genocide, for war crimes, and for crimes against humanity, but yet there are corporations and governments who are doing worse things with the environment. I mean, the Ogoni land, for example, I use this very good example because the United Nations Environmental Program did a study of that place. People there are born in pollution, they live in pollution, they die in pollution, they are buried in pollution. The land polluted to the depth of five meters is incredible. How are you going to clean that? Our UNEP estimates $1 billion for setting up the structures to begin the process of cleaning. And we estimate $100 billion to clean just a portion of the Niger Delta with just 800 people living. So we have, there's enough grounds for an international environmental criminal tribunal where those who commit ecocide will be brought to book. And this should not just be, we cannot jail a corporation. We need to get the directors, the chairman, the, the, so that when they know that they're going to face this kind of accountability, they'll be forced to think about a better way to do things. Um, the process, and I think both your questions are somewhere related. Uh, I, I see it about, I actually see it in terms of deepening of democracy. I don't see any other. Resistance is one way in which you see democracy actually function. And you need to find ways to make democracies of the world function better. Um, and democracies is one about rights um, of, of people. Um, for instance, one very important right which makes a huge difference is the right to say no or the right to say yes, okay? Um, since that right has come into India under, we have a new law in which uh, communities have to give written consent to projects that are coming up in uh, and around their villages, particularly forest communities. Um, however badly managed that right may be and however disempowered people may be, the, f the right get getting established starts getting used, and as it gets get getting used, it gets more and more deepened. Now, that right of being able to, to decide, to be able to um, have prior informed consent as known in, sort of, um, in international parlance, um, has to also be supported by other um, democratic institutions which have been weakened over time. I mean, in the last 20 years, Rio to Rio, I don't think we have seen more decimation of the independent media than we have seen ever before. So you cannot have a functioning democracy if you have a compromised media. You cannot have a functioning democracy if you have compromised electoral systems which are based on putting a value to the vote um, of your, to your own vote, which is what the US has done. You can't legalize contributions to, um, to, um, to making it a functioning democracy. So I think we have weakened democracy. You cannot in weakening of democracy demand that you will have a functioning environmental uh, 
uh, movement. And I think that's the process that needs to be really seriously looked at and really seriously fixed. And that's what worries me in India because I see weakening happening, but it also encourages me because I also see where the signs are of uh, democratic control over, over resources, over, over decision making, you see changes happening as well. So I think that's the most important tool that I see. And when I look at the two giants we fought, and we can discuss this at some other length, um, I think it was just that. I mean, at no point, and I have to say this, I don't know where they are giants, and they are giants. I mean, um, uh, they can topple governments. But no point in, as being an Indian environmentalist, did I feel in any way weaker to them. And I think that's a very important statement. It's a very important sense of being able to fight your battle and to be able to win your battle, uh, knowing the fact that they will be in an equal or a level playing field. I mean, things that economists love to talk about. But I think level playing field is all about democratic processes and not about competitive processes. So I think that's where we need to fix our jargon a little bit uh, in terms of the future. I, the question that you asked about growth, I think there is a lot of misconception about growth. But let me make it very clear, I am for growth. So I don't know what the EU stands for, and I don't know how they are viewing growth, but I am not a no growth person. I'm not a person who's standing here and saying, I do not want any growth. I am simply saying whatever growth there is has to be equitable, has to be affordable, and has to be sustainable. But I am not against growth. I am not against power stations. I am not against energy. I am not even against mineral exploitation, which may be slightly different from where Nibu and I are, okay? Um, there, is, there is, however, the question about what and how you will do mineral exploitation, who will do it, who will benefit from it, how much will be done, who will have the rights to decide, what, what balance will you take between the minerals under the ground and the livelihoods over the ground, um, and who will decide all that. Those are the questions that I think any functioning democracy has to decide. And that's why I am not here to tell you what color of green is going to be. I am simply saying to you, get your paint and your toolkit right, and the colors will start flowing in itself. So I am not, I don't know what EU stands for now particularly. I used to know what EU stands for, but I think the EU is an extremely confused body right now. And honestly, from, our, from where we stand, we can't really figure it out, okay? It seems to be an highly, um, a body which has become so evangelical um, in its position that uh, it seems to have forgotten that it's not the only savior of this world. Uh, I'm not going to defend the European Union. I have a bigger problem. Uh, I'm from the United States, and we're... <laughs> we won't even try. And, and we're very wealthy, but we're still very unhappy. We want even more. And I can assure you, with the weakening of our democracy, uh, we will never give the poor nations of the world space to develop, if we can help it. Uh, I think the real possibility on the planet is that the poor countries, the developing countries in the world, will see the mistakes that we've made, will see our financial system, our economic system collapsing of its own weight and its own corruption, and will realize that the space they have to develop can, can develop in, a, in an altogether different direction. And I think that is the real possibility that we have. No. Yeah, we have yeah. but I've really become old when I start saying, the children will manage this now. We've sort of, we've messed up the earth and now the next generation will take care of it. I think it's the same concept. Let's be very clear, the elite of the world, firstly, the development paradigm as it exists today is, is something that everybody has bought into. Nobody sees that it's cracking, nobody sees, because every time it cracks, there are some band-aids put on it. 
as far as the elite are concerned. I think the only hope, as I say, and that I agree with you, I think the only space that we have is that if democracy continues to function in large parts of the developing world, then the poor in the world will definitely start demanding a different way of doing development. And if they, their voices can be heard, and if their voices can be sustained, then they will put in enough pressure on governments to change their way of doing things. So I don't think it's the fact that we will learn from the mistakes of the United States, but I think we will learn from our own imperatives. And I think that's a strength that we have. But that does not mean that you in the United States don't need to fix what you're doing. That, I think, is much more important. Sorry, Juan, no, I jumped no, in. Sorry, no, sorry. Okay. <laughs> now Dima is going to say the last word. Yeah. <laughs> the last word? <laughs> okay, uh, well, let me just say also that uh, I quite agree that we need to deepen democracy, but it's not just in the, it's, it's got to be everywhere, in the global north and the global south. Yeah. We need democracy in the United States. We need democracy in the UK. The definition of democracy has to be transformed to be people actually taking power, having control over their life, their resources. Because right now, whether in the White House is the corporation who are calling the shots everywhere. So we have, there's a lack of democracy globally, which is something that we need to work on from the ground level up. True, very true. Thank you very much, Tom. <clears throat>